Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 2011 release, The Cabin in the Woods. And this is actually one of my favorite horror films of pretty much all time. Uh, I know that's a lot for some people to hear. It wasn't super popular when it came out, but it's kind of gained a cult set status after that. I have some theories on that I'll talk about a little bit. But um, just so people know, when I'm releasing this review video, it's after I've done a live stream specifically about this film. Now, I did a live stream about the platform that was on Netflix, uh, and I got a, a lot of really good participation out of that. People coming up with some really interesting, really cool things. So uh, I'm going to be talking about some kind of different stuff in the live stream than I am with this review. So they kind of go together and kind of supplement each other. So if you're really interested in Cabin in the Woods and you're watching this, check out the live stream as well. Um, and, you know, you can skip around in that because it's a live stream. it be some downtime. Anyway, this film was directed by Drew Goddard, who did Bad Times at the El Royale. He actually hasn't directed a whole lot. He's been more of a writer. Uh, he also was involved in writing this film, but he directed Bad Times at the El Royale. He also wrote Cloverfield, Star uh, World War Z, and The Martian. Uh, it was written by Goddard and Joss Whedon. Obviously, a lot of people know Joss Whedon, but for those of you who don't, uh, he did the original Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. He also wrote a bunch of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer show. He's also really well known for the beloved show Firefly, which only had one season, but was very good. He also wrote scripts for Toy Story, Alien Resurrection, Serenity, The Avengers, Avengers Age of Ultron, and Justice League. The last of those was not good. Um, so obviously it stars a young Chris Hemsworth in this, and it's very important to note that it came out the same year as uh, Thor. He was in Thor, and Cabin in the Woods came out the same year. Uh, I think if he was in Thor, and then it was like years later they wanted him to do Cabin in the Woods, that probably would not have happened. It's just kind of funny now because he's so well known for his Thor role, watching him in a movie like this. It's like, it's very different. Uh, Fran Kranz as Marty in this was amazing. Uh, my favorite character, a lot of people's favorite characters, is the lovable stoner who figures it all out. Uh, he was in things like Donnie Darko, The Village, the show Dollhouse, which I've heard really good things about but haven't seen. And You Might Be the Killer is the more recent one that is available on Shudder, I believe. And I haven't seen it yet, but I want to because I've heard good things. Uh, Richard Jenkins is in this, who a lot of people will not know him by name, but will know him by sight. Uh, he was in movies like I Heart Huckabees, which I love, Step Brothers, which is awesome, The Shape of Water, which he was nominated for an Academy Award for, Let Me In, which is a remake of um, Let the Right One In, Bone Tomahawk, which I've heard a lot of good things about, and Kong Skull Island, which I didn't think was going to be good, but it was good. It was fun. And then Bradley Whitford, another one of those guys where you know what he looks like, but you don't know his name. He was in movies such as Philadelphia, Billy Madison. He was in the show The West Wing, which is crazy popular, but I've never watched. He was in Get Out, The Post, Godzilla King of the Monsters, which I did not like, and The Handmaid's Tale. So, done a lot of good stuff. The budget for this was $30 million. It made $66.5 million. So, it wasn't... When it came out in the theaters, I remember it being out, and I didn't hear a lot about it. Mainly what I had heard about it is that people didn't like it. They were mad about it. And, and my big theory on why that occurred is because the trailer made it look more of like a straight-up horror film, and more so like slasher film. And I think a lot of people went into the theater with that expectation, and with a lot of people, when something doesn't live up to the expectation or live up to any sort of hype, they get mad about it, and they immediately write it off as, this is a bad film, it sucked. Um, whereas, if you go into it not expecting a whole lot, you may feel very differently about it. So I think that was kind of the issue with Cabin in the Woods, is it was portrayed in the trailer as a straight-up, like, slasher-ish type film, but it's not, not at all, as, you know, if you're watching this, you know that, which, if you're watching this, I will, I, I hope you would have already seen the film, because spoilers, spoilers, spoilers coming, because it's an older film. Uh, Whedon and Goddard actually wrote this script in only three days, which is pretty impressive. Uh, they had met because they worked on the shows Buffy and Angel, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel together, so then they got together, they wrote this in three days. Uh, they said, Joss Whedon has actually, on the record, said, 
Uh, it was meant to be a satire on torture porn, and it was also meant to kind of revitalize the slasher film, which if you look at it from that standpoint, I see what they're saying. They do kind of make fun of the kind of over-the-top gore and violence and everything, so that's the torture porn aspect, but it also is very slasher-esque, um, which, you know, plays really well. AFX Studio did the practical effects for this. That is the uh, company that is owned by Heather Langenkamp and her husband, whose name is David Leroy Anderson. Uh, and then there was some drama with this film, actually. Um, not just some of the drama in the film, but author Peter Gallagher had filed a lawsuit claiming that the movie ripped off a 2006 book that he had published. That book was called The Little White Trip, A Night in the Pines. Um, the case was then dismissed five months later. So I guess it wasn't a big deal. You know, it could have been one of those instances where he thought, well, maybe, and maybe this will get more press for my book. I don't know. Or maybe it was legitimate in his mind, but courts didn't see it that way. The artwork in blood in the beginning of this film is very interesting to me very interesting because it actually gives you drawings of what is actually going to happen in the film. It shows all this kind of ritual sacrifice and uh, stuff like that. And, and with the way the drawings are done, it indicates that these are very old. This is kind of a something that's been going on for a long, long, long time uh, because it seems like it's, you know, pictures kind of taken from museums, basically, from, or archived uh, material that's been found. During first watch, you're just lost when they're talk, uh, talking out, uh, about the Swedes and how they've never failed. I mean, really, I was very confused the very first time I watched it. I've watched it so many times since cause, since I liked it so much. But the first time I watched it, I was just so confused because where it starts, it's kind of like it seems like it's this underground office. And um, Jenkins and Whitmore or Whitford are 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 just like chit-chatting and you're like what is going on here where's the cabin where's the woods and then they're talking about how the swedes have um never failed before uh, i say never yeah how the swedes have never failed before and you're like what are they talking about because they do a lot of that very early on until you understand what's really going on and there's kind of the big reveal of they're setting things up and they're you know monitoring these college kids as they go to the cabin in the woods uh, there's just all these kind of little things that just seem confusing. They seem out of place. And you're just like, what is going on here? But that's what I like because then it makes it makes there a bit of like a build to the actual reveal of what's really going on. And then when you understand what's happening, you're like, oh, okay, interesting premise. Um, but that's once again if you're open to it. Basically, if you have an expectation, it's just going to be a straight up horror film. You might be very disappointed in it. But, you know, them talking about that stuff, I like how it's just these little things where on a second viewing, you know exactly what they're talking about. The f but the first time around, you're just confused and you're like, what are they referring to? It's so vague at this point. Society needs to crumble. We're just too chicken shit to let it. That is a quote that happens in the very beginning of the film when they're kind of riding their little golf cart to their their station. Uh, to do their thing. Uh, that is strong foreshadowing for the film. Obviously, in the end, everything ends. It goes to hell. Uh, that society needs to crumble. We're just too chicken shit to let it. Um, no, I'm sorry. That's not when they're driving the golf cart. That's when Marty is rolling a joint in the Winnebago. He says that. He's kind of espousing all his stoner knowledge. And at this point in the film, you're just kind of writing it off of, as... He does a lot of drugs. This is how people who do a lot of drugs end up talking. They're all philosophical and bring down, you know, get off the grid, bring down society, all this type of stuff. So you kind of write it off. But it's crazy because in the end, he becomes the hero. He becomes, well, actually, does he really become the hero? That's that's a question because um, in the end, the world ends. So I assume for everyone else, he is not the hero. Uh, for him and his friends, he is a hero. But for the rest of the world, he is not a hero which is kind of an interesting thing to think about. Uh, I love how they clearly lay out how each character does not fit into the typical horror fodder trope, but they slowly become that through the chemical influences that have been planted. You know, they talk about how, you know, they were planting it in Marty's weed. Obviously that didn't work because of his, uh, how much weed he has smoked in his life. He's kind of resistant to the drug. Uh, but they were putting it in the beer. They put it in, like, Jules' hair dye, you know, things like that. Um, but they they do a really good job of very early on kind of showing that these are not your typical 
horror movie kill fodder people you know like kurt is a jock he's not really a jock he's very very smart when he's talking about um those books from class and he's kind of pointing out to to dana he's like you know you don't need to read this read this this is what's in the lectures this is what isn't so he's actually like a super intellectual guy then you have like Jules, who's supposed to be like the dumb blonde bimbo. You immediately find out she's not even blonde. She dyed her hair, um, and she's not a bimbo really. She's actually smart and a caring person until later when the drugs kick kick in. And then Dana, you know, you get the idea. It's not super overt in the beginning, but you get the idea early on that she might not be a virgin, even though she's supposed to be the virgin. Which they have a nice joke in this about, you know, we work with what we have, you know, which I think was. Sigourney Weaver what she said um at the end but um yeah I just love how they kind of they they give you these things very very early on to let you know immediately these are not the typical you know death fodder tropes for for your usual horror film so it tells you immediately this is not going to be your typical horror film this is going to be very very different and we're trying to make a statement here and they are making a statement the drawing of the professor in the beginning yeah lets you know yeah, I already talked about that, sorry. The part with the bird hitting the energy fence is confusing. One of those other moments where it's like, what is going on here? I have no idea until you have a second and further viewings after it. Um, and it, it, it really comes out of nowhere. It really catches you off guard. So for that reason, it kind of piques your interest even more. You're like, okay, what what is this? This is confusing. It's interesting. It's weird. It's all these things. And you don't see it coming. And the cool thing is, you kind of, like, enough happens after that that you end up really kind of forgetting about the energy fence until Kurt tries to do the jump in the dirt bike and hits the thing. And I think the first time I watched it, I may have totally forgotten about it until he actually hits it. But there are people who I've watched it with who have been like, oh, no, he's going to jump this. That that thing is there. That energy fence, is that is that what's going to happen to him too? But it's a nice moment. And it's good that they kind of have enough happen in between. Uh, the guys in the control room mocking the Harbinger, that dude Mordecai who's at the gas station, the old coot. Uh, this could be seen as its own moment of foreshadowing because they're taking it too easy at their job. They kind of, you know, show that quite a few times with it. But they also aren't taking him seriously. And he's the Harbinger. So in this moment, within, you know, the horror movie trope, the harbinger is supposed to be the one who kind of warns the kids and says where you're going is very dangerous don't go there so like literally he told them that that things are are going to go bad but they choose to go anyway now the harbinger is on the phone talking to these guys who are setting all this stuff up and since they're not taking him seriously like the kids and they're not listening to his warnings like the kids uh it's a foreshadowing that they are doing exactly at that point what these college kids were doing is hearing a warning and choosing to take it easy to just write it off and here comes a disaster because of it so i thought that was in interesting this speaks to a small theme of not taking for granted how things typically go you get two lacks and everything could end up falling apart i mean job wise which is in this film but you know in life in general and you know in many facets of life, really. If you get too lax about stuff and you're just like, oh, we've done this so many times, there's m more of a margin for error because you take it more easy, you're not as attentive to things, and there are a few things that end up going wrong with this. The betting is such a great funny scene in this, and it makes you wonder what the bet is, basically. This is before they really... Um, you know, have revealed that the that they have to pick one of these items to figure out what shows up to try and kill them. And then once you figure that out, you're like, oh, this is funny. Uh, and then it makes the betting even funnier. Uh, and and to, to kind of quickly, like, look and see all the stuff that's on the board is really, really cool. Um, the talk about how the system works and what choices the college kids have to make is where you see how they're using the horror formula and making an example of it. Um, so they, this is the, the kind of reveal of it showing that it's a super, super self-aware film. That, you know, it's a very self-aware horror film, and they're letting you know that as they're describing, okay, this is kind of how it works. They're describing it to the guy who's the former military, who's kind of a security guard now for that company. 
I assume it's a company. It seems like it's a private company, to be honest. But maybe it's, like, in that realm, it's, like, government-funded. I don't know. But um, that's a little ambiguous. But they're explaining to this guy, like, giving him the breakdown, which is obviously for the benefit of the audience. But they're basically telling you, you know, this is how it goes. This is how it works. These are the decisions that they have to make. You know, we're just kind of guiding them in certain ways. But ultimately, the, they have to do these things on their own. They have to make these decisions. We give them that extra push to make it happen. But at its root, they have to do it. They have to, you know, disregard the harbinger. They have to, you know, choose what item they use. You know, they have to make all these moves that get them killed, you know all these things so at the same time you know all the choices that are being done in the control room are the same type of thing that ends up leading them to total disaster at the very end the characters start going to their tropes when they start drinking the drug beer that's the main part where you really see them changing in personality this helps in choosing their item because cloud cloud uh the clouding of their judgment at that point i'm assuming especially you can especially see that in the part where they just disregard when Marty's just like, I'm drawing a line in the fucking sand. We're not reading the Latin. <laughs> Which, that, there are a lot of references in this to uh, Evil Dead. You know, obviously the cabin itself, it looks like the cabin from Evil Dead. The trap door in the cabin also looks like just what was in Evil Dead. When they find the thing and uh, the diary and they're going to read the Latin, obviously also from uh evil dead and then a buddy who i was watching this with had pointed out to me when they're doing the betting and they have the dry erase board up one of the lines says deadites and deadites is the reference to like the zombie type characters who are possessed in evil dead so a lot a lot of references to evil dead in this which is cool because obviously it's great there is a plot hole in this no sociology majors in college on a full academic scholarship I'm kind of joking a little bit, but I found it was kind of weird that they, they said that Kurt, you know, this is when Marty's kind of breaking down that people are acting differently. He's like, when did, you know, Jules become a celeb -yotard? And when, and Kurt, you know, Kurt's not this dumb jock guy. Like he, he got a full scholarship for sociology. And I was just like, it hit me. And I'm like, who gets a full scholarship for sociology? That's kind of a, not a typical thing. I think they could have picked something more obvious but i don't know it's funny it's hilarious when all the guys are glued to the monitors waiting to see boobs occur in this uh then they say gotta keep the customer satisfied i thought that was funny which is true i mean honestly this is kind of true i found with a lot of how males interact with the horror genre uh, especially with older films there's kind of this expectation of boobs are going to show up in a horror film especially if they're women and they're scantily clad uh, and they're going to get killed, like, there's always going to be boobs. And that, I think that's kind of a point that they're making in this film at that point, with all these guys standing there at the monitor just ogling and just waiting, like, where are the boobs? I feel like that actually happens with um, a bunch of guys who are into horror films. It's just this expectation, and it's an expectation that's been built over it being done so much in horror, which this film in general, obviously, is just about talking about that formula. Let's look at this horror formula Specifically in this film, let's use this typical horror formula to show you that we don't need to use this typical horror formula. And maybe, in fact, we should tear this thing down, burn it to the ground, destroy the world, and rebuild it with something new. Uh, I like the funny talk about zombie subgenres. It's a really cool moment because it's funny where he's just like, hey, I had zombies. I think as a woman, she's like, I had zombies. Like, yes, you had zombies. But this is, what they say, zombie redneck torture family. And then you also see there are other versions of zombies on, on that dry race board. So it kind of speaks to how in the horror genre, there are a bunch of sub-genres. Sub and it's true. Like, there are sub-genres of zombies themselves. And that's one of the cool things about horror as a genre in general, which, you know, this is kind of pointing out is that there's so many subgenres. Think about other genres of film. How many subgenres within those genres are there really? I feel like horror is the most rich and it has the most fleshed out subgenres. It's just something that this film makes me think about. The bear trap that is used by I think it's Judah Buckner. 
is an awesome, awesome weapon. I, I love that that's what they decided to go with, the bear trap in this. It's really good. And then also just the zombie redneck torture family as a villain is a cool uh, kind of new take on zombies. And I really liked it. It was It was super cool. I love the touch of the moment where Dana says she's never had sex and then reala realizes that she says it, gets this kind of confused look, and is like, you know, like, that's not true. She says something to the effect of, like, no, that's not true. That's not what I meant. And it, it, it's this moment that she's become conscious of the fact that her behavior's changed. She's saying things that aren't true. She's saying things she wouldn't normally say. So it's that kind of moment of her getting a glimpse of, something going wrong which obviously marty is seeing a lot more of when he's like flipping out and he's like hearing the voices it was pretty funny it's hilarious when kurt clotheslines patience buckner i don't know if people really caught that because it's a kind of a quick thing when he's running and marty's outside peeing and he's like run 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 and they turn around and he like clotheslines the young zombie girl um patience buckner I, I just, I laugh at it every time. It's funny the way they shot it. I, I enjoy it. They almost pump Thorazine into Marty's room, but then leave it to Judah. And they could have avoided everything. Like, they're about to pump in the Thorazine to kind of sedate him so he can get killed because he's too with it with what's going on. But they're like, no, 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 hold on. Judah Buckner will take care of it. And that ends up being their pivotal mistake because they just assume that something they don't control is going to take care of that. When they could have controlled it and tipped it more in their favor, which why wouldn't you at that point, to be honest? Because they've done it continually throughout the film, you know, with drugging them, with, you know, releasing the pheromones to get uh, Kurt and Jules to lay down and start having sex in the, in the woods, all those things. You just assume Marty is dead, and it was a great idea to kind of set that up because you just assume he's dead because he gets pulled over the little hill of dirt and then you hear like the stabbing noise and you see blood fly up and you assume oh he's done and not only you as an audience member assume that but the guys in the control room obviously assume that because they're like oh at this point it's just dana we're good until they get that call from upstairs they talk about how you used to be able to just throw a girl into a volcano i don't know if anyone caught that it's it's a real quick thing I think this speaks to the change in how much becomes involved in satisfying horror audiences. It has to be more extreme and more gory. I really think this is them kind of making that statement that they've been having to do this ritual sacrifice for a long time, but it was much easier before because the demands of the audience at that point were much more simple. But over time, it's kind of grown and grown and grown as they get used to what you've been doing. They need something similar and the same, but also a little bit new at the same time. So it used to be so simple that you could just take a woman, throw her in the volcano, there's your sacrifice, we're all good. Now it's way more elaborate, as you can see by you know what they're setting up in this film. And I just thought that was a cool moment. Is it wrong that I laugh when Kurt hits the energy fence? People can answer that down in the comments. I always laugh when he hits that energy fence. I don't know why. It's just funny to me. I think part of it is like how he kind of like tumbles down. I don't know. I mean, I know the the little like sparks are from the actual dirt bike, but he's falling with it. The reveal of all the creatures in the elevators is unbelievably fun. And then the mass mayhem when they're all let go is even more fun. Um, just seeing what they came up with for creature designs and, and creature types was really, really cool. And that starts with the elevators and it continues with when they all start getting released from the elevators. And my buddy even said, he was like, look, uh, he likes in particular the second wave. Like you think that maybe everything's been released and then they, sh the elevators come up again and there's even more. And you're like, Oh my gosh, this is even crazier. It takes it from crazy mayhem to even more crazy mayhem. And it's just fun the ending of this film is so much fun because it's so nuts it's gory it's violent it's insane there's a lot to look at it's it keeps you pumped it keeps you interested at least it does for me the cut to the beer being pulled from the cooler is an amazing cut scene uh where you know dana's trying to escape the winnebago that went underwater and she's you know getting towards the top and they immediately cut to one of them pulling a beer out of a cooler and celebrating because they think they've achieved everything they needed to. 
The part where the guy says he's almost rooting for Dana and then gets distracted by partying is much like the horror audience attitude. Um, he's kind of talking about, oh man, I really feel for her. I kind of want her to make it. And then he realizes people come in to start partying and he goes, tequila is my lady, my lady, which is funny. But at the same time, I think it's potentially making a point of how it is for us horror fans is when we're watching the film, like we feel for the person, but at the same time, we're also wanting the kill scene. Like we want to see how they're going to do it. They, we need that body, uh, that body count to tick up. And I think this is kind of a point of that because he's acting that way. Um, getting Sigourney Weaver was great for this. She was the pivotal final girl, which is what this formula is predicated on, basically. You know, Dana's the idea of she's got to be the final girl. She's got to go through hell. And Sigourney Weaver as Ellen Ripley in Alien, same thing. Really good. Alien and Aliens were the the good the real good ones but uh yeah i just thought it was cool they could get sigourney weaver for that because it meant a lot uh quote it's time to give someone else a chance at the end tearing down the horror formula and letting someone new step in that was kind of my question do you think that's kind of what they meant by that go ahead and put a comment down there um and then just kind of some some ideas to wrap up there's so much comedy gold in this film it makes it unbelievably fun, in my opinion. I don't know if you would then classify it as a horror comedy. I think you could make that argument that it is a horror comedy at that point. Uh, I haven't seen a horror film that's this self-aware since Scream. And if you can think of another horror film that is extremely self-aware like that, that's actually not a horror comedy, put it down there. Or like an overt one, because I can feel, I feel like, you know, like Tucker and Dale versus Evil, like it, to a degree it's it's pretty self-aware. But, um, you know, scary movie, obviously, unbelievably self-aware because it's all about making fun of how horror f films are. But, um, yeah, put some comments down there. Can you think of any other ones that are really self-aware? I love how this film uses the horror movie formula to show how dumb that formula kind of is, saying we don't have to stick this way. We think that this is really what the audience wants, but sometimes it's time to just tear it all down, let the world end, or the horror film world and then let's start it anew let's do something new something fresh let's take it into our own hands the gods could be seen as the big studios and could be seen at the audience i don't know what people's thoughts are on that maybe put a comment down there on what you think do you think it's them kind of talking about studios being a problem because they're saying that horror films need to be done a certain way and use a certain formula or do you think that's mainly driven by the audience or is that a combination of the two i could see it all three ways Tear it all down and start anew. Even though not following the formula is said to become Armageddon, is it really? What comes after the fallout of this? That's a big question. And once again, if you want to put some comments down here about that, all good. So, obviously I've already said I like this film quite a bit. So, uh, on a five-star scale with half stars in play, I'm giving it five stars out of five. I think this is an outstanding film. It looks really great. It was directed really well. Obviously, the acting is awesome. Um, it's great. Cinematography, directing, acting. The music is great. Um, the premise is great. The script is unbelievable. And especially since it was done in three days. I mean, it makes you think. It's an intellectual film. It's funny at the same time. It wraps so much in, into one film that it is impressive. So I'm giving it five stars out of five. And yeah, tell me your thoughts. Comments down there. Do me the quick favor of hitting the subscribe button. I would really appreciate that to keep me going. If you're already subscribed, hit the thumbs up. Uh, and if you are going to subscribe or if you're already subscribed, make sure you hit the notification bell so you know when I'm putting up videos. But more importantly, when I'm doing live streams, because that's the big thing, if you want to participate. But thanks, everyone, for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.